Well, hello, hello, guys. You're listening to Beauty Bites with Dr. K, Secrets of a Plastic Surgeon. And today on the podcast, I'm delighted to interview Nina Davaluri, who is a lovely, beautiful Indian American woman who is one of the first Indian American women to win the Miss America competition. And she's gone on to host a reality TV show made in America on ZTV America, as well as become an advocate for diversity, women empowerment, and speaking about ladies of different complexions and skin tones. She's a highly respected speaker. She's been featured in news articles around the world from the New York Times to the Wall Street Journal. And she's just an educationally brilliant woman too. So welcome, Nina. Thanks so much for having me. Well, it's so exciting to interview a a Miss America. (laughs) (laughs) And the Indian one, I thought I was so proud of you and you won. Thank you so much. It's crazy because it feels like a lifetime ago. So much has has changed, and that was such a pivotal moment in my life. And um, it still it still feels you know surreal sometimes. What year were you, Miss America? Twenty fourteen. So it's been six years since I since I won the title. Amazing, and it's probably opened so many opportunities for you. And this year, you've really I think developed your platform. Um, as an individual for women empowerment and rights of women and speaking out about skin tone and complexions in this year of diversity and racial turmoil that seems to be such an appropriate topic. So tell us a little bit about your complexion series that you've been working on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It actually started, um, you know, I've been advocating for this officially for six years, you know, since the time that I won, I say, but essentially my entire life. And I remember, you know, the morning after I won, my platform going into Miss America was celebrating diversity through cultural competency. I grew up with a lot of misconceptions about the Indian culture. Um, and I think that's, sorry, I'm silent. <laughs> I grew that's up with okay. a lot of- <laughs> Wait, start that <laughs> sentence again. <laughs> um, you know, I grew up with a lot of misconceptions about the Indian culture, my background, where I came from. So I constantly found myself in conversations correcting those stereotypes. So even when I won Miss America, I didn't just wake up and say, okay, I'm going to be the poster child for diversity now. It was something that I had really advocated for and, and founded um, several years before. And so the morning I won, what was interesting is that, like, I should start with the night I won. Uh, I remember I received very xenophobic and racist comments towards um, towards my win. Uh, just, I was called a terrorist. I was called the 7-Eleven. Um, and I think that was the opportunity where I knew that I had to continue my platform and use it to educate. Um, and that's what I did consistently traveling across the country and even, even now. Uh, but there was a separate conversation that started happening within India. And I remember the morning after I woke up, there was a headline in, a, in an Indian newspaper. And it said, is Miss America too dark to be Miss oh India? Oh my God, seriously. And <laughs> Right, but that's so normalized in Indian culture. And for me, that was a moment where I had grown up with comments like, don't go out in the sun and um, you're gonna get too dark or, oh, you'd be so much more beautiful if you were a few shades lighter. And this is such a pervasive, toxic stereotype in, in in India and in many countries around the world. And so for me, when I read that, it's, it was that moment of enough is enough. And I remember going into the Miss America competition, competition wanting to become the first Indian Miss America because I grew up watching that feeling like I could never fit in that role because I wasn't the stereotype. I didn't have blonde hair or blue eyes. I wasn't white. I didn't perform what people would consider a normal talent. I did a Bollywood dance. and. I recognized that it wasn't just about me, it was about the, those young girls watching and for them to finally say, this year Miss America looks like me. And for also people in India seeing, you know what, this year like Miss America is darker skin tone and that is um, representation. And so uh, for me, that's what really launched Complexion was continuing this conversation around colorism that is, is still pervasive in our culture. It's so true. I mean, I've been told that, of course, by all Indian aunties and my own mom, like, stay out of the sun, you're going to get so dark. And like, that does gets in your brain at some level to where you start equating um, lighter skin with better skin mm-hmm. or a better person or a more virtuous appearance. So I think that that's totally 
extremely true. It permeates Indian culture, Asian culture, mm-hmm. much of much of the world. So it's not just in the United States of America that darker skin types are discouraged or looked down upon. And I think it's so valuable what you're doing for women and young girls especially. So talk a little bit about your campaign to reverse um, how companies are marketing women with bleaching products because I think that's really interesting too. Yeah, you know, I it was it was actually one of the stories I share uh, within the documentary is um, I remember when I was eight years old, I grew up going back to India in the summer, and my, that's where my family is from, and you're berated by fair and lovely ads, which I think is probably the market leader in terms of skin whitening or bleaching products, and you would not only see these advertisements on TV, billboards everywhere. You would also just see it within the Bollywood industry, cinemas, movies, everyone in front of the camera is very light skinned models, magazines. It's just something that is considered normal there um, or the ideal and equates to beauty and success. And so I was I was eight years old and I remember I had a patch of eczema on my skin and my uncle took me to the dermatologist in India and he gave me a cream. He said, oh, it's just eczema. Um, Apply this twice a day. It'll it'll be okay." And I remember looking at him directly in the eye and I said, do you have a cream that will make me lighter? Mm -hmm. And I was eight years old and I believed at that young age, I believed that if I, because I was dark, I was not beautiful. And the only way I would be considered beautiful is to have light skin. And in the documentary, we found out as we were interviewing, you know, we interviewed everyone from children to adults and across the spectrum of socioeconomic class too, which was really important to me. And we found a young girl who was four years old who started using Fair and Lovely because she saw her mom using it. And these are, this was actually a young girl who grew up in an orphanage. And these are, you know, very, these are people who live in poverty who still will find the money to spend on a product that is obviously selling a golden ticket to success, which is, which is so not true. This little comments that um, children are so perceptive and they pick up on little triggers and, you know, noticing that their mom is using a product or noticing that, you know, they try to look a certain way. It's just the same as when you talk about, oh, I'm on a diet, I got to lose weight, I look so fat in this outfit. And then your daughters internalize that and so they need to become Mm -hmm. skinnier and worry about their weight and they're not perfect, good individuals unless they're skinny. So I think just your whole entire idea of opening up this conversation will be so valuable cross-culturally for every culture because um, I know Asian women also suffer the same issues that their moms want them to be indoors, out of the sun, not be Mm -hmm. tanned, athletic. And in Southern California, it's so refreshing to see like so many women of every culture just go with the tanned skin and the bronze and like you be the woman you want to be, hopefully. But right. I think it yeah. starts with changing the conversation at that really at our mother's level. Which yeah, you know, absolutely. Do you think and we can I change think, our mothers and grandmothers in India? I don't think so. <laughs> Not this <I> generation. <laughs> I do. And I think, you know, that's actually something I experienced. Um, and I think that's really important is because I remember when, you know, I started producing, officially producing this documentary almost two years ago now. So, you know, this has been quite a while in the making, I suppose, in terms of filming in in different various countries. And so the last place I was actually able to film was India before COVID happened. And I remember, um, you know, my, my, after we had finished filming the segment, you know, we were there for a month, I went to visit my family because you can't go to India without visiting your family, obviously. And um, I went to my aunt's house who I equate to almost my godmother. She's my mom's sister, grew up very close to her. And uh, she had one of her friends over and you, you know, we're having coffee, tea, all the snacks, you know, typical. And the, the friend that she had over said something along the lines of, they were talking about someone who had gotten married and she said, oh yeah, you know, growing up she used to be a lot more fair and now she's kind of a little darker now. And my aunt, I was ready to like clap back, say all the things. And it was my aunt actually who said, you know, we really can't make comments like that anymore. Uh, you know, Nina's been working on this documentary and, um, you know, it's, it's hurtful. And for me to even witness that moment happening, I never thought that that would actually change um, in my own home. But I think that was the most important thing that I could have done with all of this is that 
the people closest to me now understand. And I think that the more we talk about it, it's not just one conversation, obviously. This has been kind of a lifetime thing that I've grown up with and addressed. And I didn't start speaking out until really six years ago, how much it personally affected me. Yeah, it's very true. And I think, um, were you able to change the manufacturer's um, advertising campaigns, do you think? With Fair and so that, Lovely? That's the next, yeah. Yeah, so that's the next big question. I launched a, a petition called See My Complexion, um, which is still ongoing and um, really positive response, I'm grateful to say, because I think so many of us really connect with this and, and have a story related to colorism. Um, and so from that, I launched this in June, and uh, since then, Johnson & Johnson discontinued their line of whitening products. L'Oreal and Unilever, and Unilever owns Fair and Lovely, uh, has announced that they will stop the use of fair, white, and light in their marketing and branding um, products. So which now does mean the end of Fair and Lovely, which has now been changed to Glow and Lovely. Do I think that's enough? Absolutely not. I don't think a name change is enough because ultimately these whitening products are still out there. I think the bigger question now, and, and now that so many people are watching, is how they roll out their campaign. They said that they're going to use more inclusive models of all different skin types. You know, it's not just a simple name change that's enough to change an ideology and a culture. It's really about also skin whitening products, how they're how they're rolling out their rebranding. Um, and also the Bollywood industry, they have a huge piece to play in this of the, per the stereotype that they've perpetuated. And I think both of them go hand in hand from products to Bollywood to also magazines and media conglomerates promoting this image. And so all of them collectively, one, need to recognize that they've they've really created this hierarchical image of beauty and they need to actively dismantle it. Even in the movies that happens where the villains are darker skin type, you know, kind of huskier guys or even the women that are the evil ones are darker and always the beautiful maiden who's getting married or rescued is like the fair skin, you know, lovely one. So I think it's that subliminal level of it's just built into the nature of life that white is good and dark is bad. So it's changing mm -hmm. things even organically at that level. Um, right. What do you say to girls out there who are interested in lightening and bleaching their skin? Because it's going to still keep happening. And I know that patients themselves are very affected by when they do have pigmentation or brown spots. It's one thing to bleach you know, like melasma or something that comes upon you when you're pregnant and it's not your normal skin tone. But what do you say to people who are actively out there trying to lighten their skin? I want them to ask themselves why. You know, why have they believed that lighter skin is better? Is it because it's, is it a beauty standard? Is it for a job, career? Is it marriage? Is it because you've just been told? Is, I think there's all of these questions that they, people need to start asking themselves why they believe this, who has told them that, why has it impacted them? And I know for me, that's, that's what I was told. It was just accepted, it was considered normal. And I think in filming the documentary, so many people, when I would share my story and ask them, have they experienced this? It was really the first time that they had asked themselves these questions, well, why am I using this product? Or why do I believe that this is what I need to be beautiful um, or to get married, which is obviously a you know, kind of ingrained in it too. When you look at ads, it's looking for a slim trim fair. Indian matchmaking right now is, is, mm. a, is a topic of discussion. And, you know, that still happens. And I think that's, the, that's what we really need to start addressing in our own homes is that it's, these conversations are happening behind closed doors on TV. It's not, you know, this is, it's not, rel it's when people say, oh, that's old, old school mentalities, we don't think like that, that's not true. It still very much exists, um, even here, even in families here. Are you watching the Netflix Indian matchmaking TV show? <laughs> that's really fun. I, I'm loving it. <laughs> I, I have. You know, it's, it's really interesting because I think it has brought so many issues to the forefront of what it is like, um, you know, both here and in India and the family dynamics. And I think that these are very real conversations that need to be happening. Um, and how it's also very gender roles when we talk about colorism, how it affects females exponentially more than males. Um, it does, of course, affect them as well. But there's just a lot of things that come into play, which I think has been really interesting to see these, this unfold. Yeah, well, the matchmaker has a list that's like how tall the girl is and what's her complexion. Right. Does she have a wheatish or light honey complexion or, you know, 
I guess it's part of the criteria. So that's, <laughs> that's a very fun show. It just uh, tells a lot about human nature. Like you don't have to be Indian to enjoy that show because it's the interesting plight of, you know, people in their thirties searching for a soulmate and why, why people don't find them or why they do. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I've enjoyed watching that. Um, you're a woman in STEM. So you have a bachelor of science in what was your specialty biology? And uh, it was, yeah, so it was actually brain behavior and cognitive science. So it was a mix of psychology and neuroscience. Wonderful. What do you say to women in STEM who are trying to get into um, STEM fields and, you know, I, I some words of encouragement for girls who are trying to break through that glass ceiling? Yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, I'm not necessarily in a pursuing an official STEM related field right now. Um, I thought STEM back in the day meant, you know, doctor, engineer, um, very science related, but I think I encourage them to think outside the box of what STEM is. There's so many creative fields uh, where you can also include STEM. And so um, I think first is finding really what you love doing and, um, and kind of steering yourself that way. And, and the creative fields aren't necessarily, doesn't mean that it's not STEM related. That's very true. Are there any aspects of um, having participated in the Miss America pageant that you would recommend the pageant officials to change or emphasize or de-emphasize? Interesting. You know, Miss America, we're approaching our hundredth year, which is crazy when you think about it. It's the longest pageant competition in, I guess, history um, of pageant world, I suppose. <laughs> um, and, it, and it was the most iconic and it's been interesting to kind of see it evolve uh, through the years. This is a pageant that only allowed young white women to compete. Um, I was, you know, I was, there's only nine black women in the history of 100 years and one South Asian, me. Um, and so I think I would like to see it move towards more inclusive, more diversity. Um, I think it's, a t it's time that they have uh, recognize that and I think a lot of companies are recognizing and asking themselves that but you know I'd like to also see representation from their management to, to board level which uh, I'm curious to see how that will play out obviously it's um, I think pageants in general there's a whole conversation of are they even relevant now um, and I think it'll be interesting to see how they evolve in order to actually change for for how, how people are today I think so, like with the Victoria's Secret and their runway show having so mm -hmm. much problems and scandal and just really not being, um, you know, open to the changes that are happening in society versus like Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue with now has body inclusivity with, you know, different mm -hmm. body shapes, sizes and handicapped women and people who are, you know, bigger frames. So I wonder if the Miss America pageant needs to evolve in that respect as well. Like, you know, there's a lot of stress on women, not only for skin color, but of course for perfect bodies. And like I right. now, I'm pretty sure that all of these ladies who participate or many of the Miss America contestants have had plastic surgery, of course, Botox and fillers. I'm a big advocate for looking and feeling your best and maintaining. But I also feel that there's so much pressure for women to look like perfect Barbie dolls all the time. How do you feel about that? I think that's that? un unfor yeah, unfortunately there is a stereotype uh, associated with pageants and plastic surgery. Um, I actually, that was my question, my final question at Miss America. Um, so I'm glad you brought it up. It was, uh, it was actually in relation to um, a news anchor um, and she had had plastic surgery to make her eyes look less Asian. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, you know, that was a question that was so right up my alley from the, not only a diversity standpoint, you have, shouldn't have to change your looks to look more American or, you know, that, that was one part of the conversation. But ultimately, yes, I do understand that people want to look and feel better. And I think that's a personal choice. Um, I don't agree with it personally, you know, it's never something I've done or had. Um, including fillers, so I'm just putting that out there. Um, and I think it is a personal preference, but I don't, I say that because you don't need to have plastic surgery to enter a competition. Um, it's not a requirement. Um, you know, it's a, a choice that I didn't choose to make for myself, but again, it's, it comes down to personal preference, but I don't, you know, I think the bigger thing too is that there is this other part of competing in pageants. And I need to clarify that Miss America and Miss USA are two different organizations. 
and uh, Miss America is the one I competed in. It's very scholarship um, focused. When you, it doesn't cost to enter, you actually, every contestant walks away with scholarship money. I myself earned over $90,000. Um, you know, was able to pay off my student loans, graduated debt free, um, and still have money to put towards my graduate degree. So there is that element. Um, Miss America also did eliminate swimsuit competition almost three years ago now. Um, so I do think that image is changing of who Miss America is, um, and uh, it'll. I'm, I'm hopeful to see more changes like that happen. Um, but again, it's just such an interesting time we live in. I think with social media and filters and you know, all of these unrealistic standards that people are now turning more towards it because it's just so much more prevalent more than mm -hmm. ever before. It really is, but I think even in my specialty, I want to be so cognizant and aware of what we do to people's faces because what we see every day in social media, on the news, in the movies, it influences our perception of what is the aesthetic ideal. So like girls 10 years from now are all going to be thinking that they're born with inadequate lips because everybody around them has like two syringe lips, you know. So I got it. I always in my head am thinking about, you know, maintaining what's natural and age appropriate and remembering that these images are searing the brains of our young people and it's branding in their heads. Whether we like it or not, this feeling of inferiority and insecurity that they may never be able to approach those ideals. And little do they know that people who post have so many filters, so much Photoshop and so much filler and help, you know, and it's not a bad thing. It's okay to idealize and have fantasy and want to be a princess and have a fairy tale image of something because that's like our brain playing with the ideal avatar of who we could be in our, in our princess brain. But we also need to have real women who don't feel inferior when they come to work and they're not all glammed up or who don't feel like, you know, women who don't feel like they need to do something to be loved. Because I am seeing that so much in the 20 to 30 year old age group that um, it's kind of even sad that the women feel like, oh, if I get my cheeks and I get my jawline and I get my everything, then I'll be the whole package and then I'll get, you know, the guy and the perfect life that I'm after. So mm -hmm. it's so much more about self-love and understanding what's good about you stripped down with no makeup, no filter, and just feeling a little bit of confidence like that. That's so hard to teach. That's yeah. our job. That's our job, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it was interesting when we were filming uh, the documentary, you know, we were going into very rural, rural villages, rural areas, and it, there was almost this expectation when people hear of, oh, you know, Miss America's gonna come today, or, you know, we're working on this, of like what I look like, or the person, you know, like what they, there's always that image, right? And then when I come in with no makeup, hair and braids, there's just this element of reaching, reaching young girls, especially on a true and honest level. There's something very special when they see that moment of here's this person who looks like me, who isn't wearing, you know, who doesn't, who who's just, it, like real. Just very grounded. Real. Yeah, very grounded yeah. and real. And there mm -hmm. and that is where that true authentic stories and self-love I think come from and, and for them to also feel comfortable to share. So I think in order to kind of with the self-love movement, we do it does start with us. And like you said, even in our homes when a mother makes a comment of, Oh, I don't look great in this dress, how we internalize that. Um, mm -hmm. it's it's everywhere. So that's so kind of you to go, you know, into rural India and like dress in a way that you are approachable because it'd be so easy for you to throw on a gorgeous outfit and so much makeup and glam that you look like intimidation, you know, but instead people can really hear your message because you are like one of a normal woman. So that's really important, I think. Um, any tips and tricks from all your travels? What do you do to keep your skin so gorgeous on these long flights and things? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, so I never wear makeup on flights. It's just not worth it. Um, and I will always, I don't, I'm actually not a huge fan of makeup wipes either. I'd love to hear your take on this. Um, I feel like it just always leaves my skin dry, uh, rather than moisturized. So more than anything, I don't travel with makeup. I do travel with a good, like extra moisturizer, I suppose, yes. or extra hydrating moisturizer like that. I will apply it like before, during and after the flight as needed. 
and lip balm. I think that's the most important thing. Drink a ton of water on the flight. Um, yes. Stay away from alcohol, especially on long flights. It's just not worth it. Um, I think those are my big, big takeaways. Um, oh my goodness. I am going to send you the best, best product that I love. So I'm with you. I washed my face. I'm going onto the plane makeup free. And then I'll apply my deep blue hydration serum, which has the hyaluronic acid. It absorbs a thousand times its weight in water to the skin. So I literally have little travel sizes of those. I put that on. I have a little whole regimen. And I actually use extra vitamin C because when you're flying, there's actually so much ultraviolet radiation that's actually even coming through the plane windows. So I use a little extra of the vitamin C. I and never even thought about that. Yeah, and That's even so some, pe some people, if you're flying during daylight hours, will apply sunscreen, which has UV protection, of course. Um, and then hydrating mist. So I carry a little mister, which is really good. It's the antioxidant mist, and it just feels so refreshing, but it also gives the skin that little extra protection from all the travels and pollution and ultraviolet. So I'm gonna send you some, you'll love it. <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to traveling safely again. So hopefully yeah. there is, that time will come. Well, thank you so much for tuning in with us today. Where can all of our listeners find you on your social handles? Yeah, um, you can find me just at Nina Davalori across the board. I'm on every social media. Um, and I would love to say that, uh, stay tuned for Complexion Series. Uh, we have an exciting announcement coming up uh, that I can't say yet, but I will say uh, follow me for, for that exciting update of where you can watch. Okay, perfect. If people want to watch it now, where can they find it to watch online? So that's the announcement. You can watch you can watch episode drops. So we have six short stories that we've released all on my social media as well as YouTube. Um, but the full length feature is coming soon. Awesome. I can't wait to see that. Um, you're so talented and so brilliant. And thank you for opening up this conversation for women of color in every, you know, every ethnicity and every culture out there. But being an Indian woman myself, especially in our culture, I think it's such a valuable contribution to changing the conversation and I really respect what you're doing so thank you so much and thank you for spreading the message it, it means a lot yeah well there you have it guys that's the beautiful and talented Miss Nina Davaluri former Miss America and current boss girl don't forget to check her out and you can find me on my Instagram doing amazing things with people's faces at Beauty by Dr. K D-R-K-A-Y and our website is the same www.beautybydrk.com that's where you can find those awesome products with the hydration serum and the, the vitamin C and the lavender mist. And I'm sure that I'm going to definitely send you some, Nina. Um, that's Sounds it amazing. for now. Thanks so much for tuning in. That's it for now, guys. Stay beautiful.